remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And certainly, the story of the week, it goes without saying, was the Boston Marathon bombing. And, of course, you guys have seen me wear this uh, Boston Bruins jersey on this show before. You know I'm a Bruins fan, but certainly we're wearing it this week for uh, much more important reasons than simply hockey games. Uh, certainly, our, all of our thoughts and prayers are with the victims out there and those that lost their lives. And, and we're still uh, shaken by this tragedy, and understandably so. Uh, however, now that we've had about a week or so uh, since the initial bombing took place, I, I do think we're slowly starting to get to a point where we can look back on things and try to put them in, in some degree of perspective, as difficult as that's going to be. And as, as that has occurred, as we've started to do that, I've, I've really started to reflect on one particular piece of the issue. Not the most important piece, but something interesting that I did notice through the week. I'm focusing on the way the traditional media, television media, print media, handled this story versus the way that you might call the new media, internet, social media, how they handled it. And a couple of things stuck out to me about that. Uh, in looking at it and as reliving it and, and remembering what happened when I was trying to find information about this through the week, I have to say that traditional media was way behind throughout the week. I think they failed. And make no mistake, ordinarily you guys hear me come out here and rail on the mainstream media, the lamestream media, with good reason. And you hear me laud Fox News a little bit, but you know, even in this case, I, I gotta say that I gotta criticize Fox News about as much as I criticize anybody else. I, I, I think they were slow on the uptake with this thing too. Throughout the whole week, everybody on cable news, on network TV news, and the newspapers and whatever, everybody was so careful and so hesitant to give information until it was just confirmed or until they knew for sure. They just wouldn't part with information. And heaven forbid they say anything at all that might lead anybody to even consider the possibility of Islamic terrorism. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. I mean, through the whole week you heard people saying crap like, well, we just don't know who this could have been. Well, we just don't know what the motivation could have been. Or even, even an idiot like Chris Matthews is up there saying, well, this could have been right-wing extreme terrorism as though there's any sort of pattern of right-wing extreme terrorism to, to fit. Sorry, it's never happened. So the most reasonable conclusion to draw, or the least, I shouldn't say conclusion to draw, the most reasonable place to start in trying to piece all of this together would have been Islamic terrorism. But all of the news networks, including Fox News, were very hesitant to go there. Even though that's the most logical place for anybody to start. And as it turned out, guess what? It was an Islamic terrorist that did it. I want to show you something. It's my shocked face. So all of that caution was for naught. Now, meanwhile, while the mainstream media, the TV media, the print media was dragging their feet and trying to do everything just so and trying to say things in just a certain way so that nobody got offended, which got in the way of them actually giving us information, the internet or social media took the lead because they didn't have to worry about such things. People on social media, on Twitter, on Reddit, Facebook, wherever, we could make whatever conclusions we wanted to. We could go find whatever information we felt was necessary. And the internet took the lead. You look at Reddit that went out there and did most of the crowdsourcing and the crowd identification for the videos that were eventually used to find the suspects. They did it far more quickly and far more effectively than a traditional journalist outlet could have done it, or far more quickly and effectively than a government investigation could have done it. Likewise for Twitter. Information was all over the place, and people sifted through it and were able to get information far more quickly than they could. And, and all of that social media and internet filled the void that television was creating. Because television and print media, they wouldn't put information out there as quickly as it was discovered. But if something was discovered, boom, it was on Twitter right away. The kicker of all of this was overnight Thursday, once the big-ass firefight started happening in Boston. I was, I was up at that hour. It happened around midnight here in Central Time. It's only about 1 o'clock in the East Coast. And my Twitter account started blowing up. I mean, people saying, hey, there's a firefight in Boston. There's grenades. There's 
ATF vehicles running through the streets, and I, I'm even seeing uh, eyewitness accounts from people who were there. I'm hearing stories of some naked dude in the middle of the street being interviewed, and I'm like, holy crap. So I go to the, I go to the TV, I start flipping channels, and none of the cable news networks have broken into programming. None of the, t the NBC or CBS or ABC, they didn't break into programming either. This mother of all firefights is happening in Boston. Something that would have made the riders of 24 go, that's a little bit too unrealistic. That's happening in Boston. The, the biggest development in the biggest story of the year, and no cable news network, no cable news channel, including Fox, is breaking into programming for it? Seriously? I mean, you've got grenades and bombs and ATF vehicles and naked dudes in the middle of the street, and they're still showing the reruns of the primetime programming for the East Coast. I'm sorry, Greta Van Suster and I love you, but you're not nearly that entertaining. So a big, a big issue I found uh, that to be. It took about a half hour or 40 minutes before the network started chiming in, before the network started breaking into programming. And I thought that was shameful. I thought that was an illustration of how far behind TV news is at this point. Now, once the... Uh, once one suspect was brought in and, and arrested, of course, one suspect was killed in that firefight. One suspect brought in who was uh, hiding in someone's boat. And according to Glenn Beck this morning, there might be another suspect out there that the federal government might have had some chicanery involved with hiding him or sweeping him out of the way. We'll have to see how that develops. But boy, could that be a big issue if that comes out to be true. Nevertheless, once that dude was arrested, this Joker dude, oh, the traditional media, they got on our butts. They, they criticized you and I for going out there and jumping to conclusions and finding information on our own and for not trusting them. And even our imbecile in chief, Barack Obama, did the same. And, and, and he reminded us that we shouldn't jump to conclusions and we should let the journalists and the government do their job. In this age of instant reporting, tweets and blogs, now, there's a temptation to latch on to any bit of information, uh, sometimes to jump to conclusions. But when a tragedy like this happens, with public safety uh, at risk and the stakes so high, it's important that we do this right. That's why we have investigations. That's why we relentlessly gather the facts. That's why we have courts. And that's why we take care not to rush to judgment, not about the motivations of these individuals, uh, certainly not about entire groups of people. Well, I hate to tell you, Barack, but for all of your criticism for our jumping to conclusions, it turns out the conclusions we jump to were 100% right. Oh, I know that's going to bug you. That's going to make your skin crawl, doesn't it? The fact that we knew instantly this was Islamic terrorism, I mean... How many other people in the world put bombs on the side of the road that are going to blow up and send shrapnel everywhere? Pretty much only the Muslims do that. So, yeah, it wasn't unreasonable for, for us to make that conclusion. And it turned out to be 100% right. That's got to make you ill, doesn't it? That's got to that's hurt. That one's got to hurt, Barack. I know it does. Because you want us all to think that Muslim terrorism isn't a thing any longer. You want us to think that nobody, we, we just don't know who could have done this, and we should just start from the perspective that anybody could have done this, and that, hey, even a right-winger, they were just as likely to do this as anyone else, and a right-winger could have done this. Well, Paris Hilton could also be celibate, but, you know, historical facts tend to indicate otherwise. Same thing with Muslim terrorism. It was the most, re it was the most obvious point to start with. You see, Barack and everybody else, we did the job of the media, and we did it far more effectively and quickly than they ever could have. What I'm getting at is this. Consumers of the news media, that's you and I, people who watch the news, read the newspapers, or go to websites, or find our news however we find it. Consumers have changed over the years. They've changed with technology. Consumers, you and I, now want as much information as possible as quickly as we can get it. We fully realize that we, you and I, are fully capable of sifting through information, figuring out on our own what's legitimate and what is not, figuring out on our own what is credible and what isn't, what is truthful and what is not, and thinking critically of the information that's out there. We no longer need journalists to filter this information for it. We're more than capable of doing it on our own. 
particularly when you consider that over the recent history when journalists have tried to filter this information they've also done so to mislead the public many times or to keep things away from the public you go back all the way to Joe McCarthy in the 50s, who was doing great work for America at the time. And Edward R. Murrow took it upon himself to derail him and make him a pariah. You go to Vietnam when Walter Cronkite turned a lot of the nation against that war. And I would argue that that single moment has had uncalculable consequences on our culture since then. More recently, you go to the 2000 election when the, when the media tried to push the narrative that somehow the election was stolen except for the fact that George W. Bush won every single recount that was mandated by Florida law. Hey, the media didn't tell you that very much, did they? They certainly didn't emphasize that. Or you go on to Iraq when the media led you to believe that there were no WMDs, when in fact there were WMDs and they were discovered. Oh, what? You didn't hear that on NBC or CBS or ABC? I'm amazed. You see, when we have given the media the power to filter information for us and tell us what was important and what wasn't, and tell us what was truthful and what wasn't, they use that power to deceive us, and we figure that out. So for that reason, among others, many of us have started turning to social media and the internet to fill that void that TV has created, and the print media has created, and the other old school traditional forms of journalism have created. And I don't even think it's the first time. I think this is the first time that you saw such a breadth of people doing it. So many people commented that that really social media was out in front of this, but I don't think it's, it's the first time it happened. In my perspective, uh, just thinking back in my own life, I go back to the Fort Hood massacre. And when that story was breaking, and of course I had the TV on, I had the internet up, I'm typing all over the place trying to find information, and I had Fox News on at one point. And the announcer on Fox News, I want to say it was Shepard Smith, not entirely sure, but whoever it was, he said, we have the name of the suspect, we have the name of the guy that is in custody, but we aren't releasing it yet because we want to confirm it. Well, what happened at that point? And what did I do at that point? I started going all over the internet trying to find it because I knew the information was out there. They have it, they're just not releasing it. And in fact, what I did when I couldn't find it in a couple of minutes, I picked up the remote control and I changed the TV channel to go find it. In that particular case, because Fox News was adhering to journalistic standards, I flipped the channel. In other words, their journalistic standards were bad for business because I ended up doing the one thing that no TV network, no news network, no entertainment network, no sports network wants anybody to do, which is to flip the channel. And I'm sure a lot of people did the same thing during this monstrosity of an event. The bottom line is this. If network and cable news, if print media is to survive, as it now competes with social media and the internet, it must now shift its focus to speed and breadth of information rather than accuracy of information and outdated journalistic standards. After all, their accuracy and standards have been lacking for quite a while, and Americans reasonably trust themselves to handle that part of the job far better than the journalists have been doing so for the last half century. Classically trained journalists, we don't need you anymore. You no longer need to be the middleman to get us information. Technology is such that we can do it ourselves. And as a result, I think the American people are becoming far more informed than they've ever been in their lives. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time. Journalistic standards?